them in a short while. But now, the University of Pretoria and the South African Reserve Bank are currently hosting a webinar to mark 100 years at the Faculty of Economic and Management Sciences at the University of Pretoria and also to celebrate the 10th anniversary of Professor Nicola Vici serving as South African Reserve Bank Chairperson in Monetary Policy Studies in the Department of Economics. We take you live now where the Reserve Bank Governor, Elise Jahanyaho, is talking. Right. Inflation targeting has delivered a long period of stability compared to the best years of the poor British system and should be considered a success for South Africa and for many other countries. To understand how we got to where we are now, looking back at 20 years of inflation targeting, we can start further back. We reach from 1979 titled The Anguish of Central Banking by Arthur Benz, who was chair of the US Federal uh, Reserve for most of uh, the 1970s. This was a period of high inflation in the US and globally. Benz asked why inflation was proving so stubborn and why central bankers are failing to stop it, to stop it. He offered a remarkable confession that the Fed could have stopped this inflation at any time, but it didn't because it lacked the will to do so. To quote from uh, the a speech directly, open quotation, inflation came to be widely viewed as a temporary phenomenon, or provided it remained mild as an acceptable condition. Maximum or full employment, after all, had become the nation's major economic goal, not stability of the price level. That inflation ultimately brings on recession and otherwise nullifies many of the benefits sought through social legislation was largely ignored. Close quotation. During Ben's tenure at the Fed, inflation averaged nearly 7% in the US, well above the 2% levels of the preceding two decades. The decade ended in tears, indeed the decade ended in tears, with high inflation giving way to falling investment and growth, and eventually a sharp and persistent increase in employment which took years to resolve. How easily could we have made the same mistakes? could have said that with high unemployment and uh, such great economic demands after apartheid, it was just not possible to control inflation. And we would have ended up with no social benefits, no growth, no extra jobs, but with high and stubborn inflation instead, just as it did with burns. But the story of South African central banking in the democratic era is not one of regret. The 1980s and early 1990s made it very clear that high inflation creates uncertainty, destroys savings, and undermines growth. The growth inflation trade-off doesn't work. We realize that inflation targeting as a transparent, an accountable policy framework provided our best shot at price stability with growth. In fact, the inflation targeting era has been one of lower inflation and lower interest rates than prevailed previously. Following our mandate, inflation has been kept under control. Even now, at this very difficult time for the economy, 
we can see the inflation targeting framework functioning properly, delivering historically low interest rates in the context of low inflation. What are the chances 20 years from now that we will still have price stability and low interest rates? Will we be agonizing 20 years from now over how we lost control of inflation? Today, there is a new generation uh, coming of age in very difficult uh, circumstances. They have many questions about the economy in general and about how monetary policy fits into the picture. Some of the questions are asked in a fiery tone, and I think that young people like to be angry. Not only have they been unlucky, reaching adulthood during one of the worst economic disasters in modern history, they are also now discovering that over the past 10 years, South Africa has been accumulating at a rapid pace, faster than any big emerging market bar Argentina. So, while the economy struggles to grow and job creation remains elusive despite the spending, there is a heavy burden of debt for future generations to carry. Justified though this anger is, we need to channel the energy, that energy into positive action. We also need to guard against making policy mistakes that could sink us into deal. Perhaps in the audience here today, there are future macroeconomic policy makers, future reserve bank governors and finance ministers. There are surely many people who will be leaders in this country in one role or another. Speech is primarily about you. You will decide much of our economic future through crisis and the ideas behind them. We are giving you many problems, but at least we have achieved price stability. It will be up to you. To... Here are some lessons we have learned to help you do that. The first lesson has to do with Arthur Ben's problem, which is about losing track of your mission and living to regret it. Perhaps the most common criticism of inflation targeting over the past two decades has been that South Africa needs a more friendly monetary policy. Burns, however, learned the hard way that there is no permanent gain both from short-term increases in why would we all like South Africa to reach permanently high growth this is beyond the powers of a central bank. As we have often communicated, most of our powerful problems should be addressed shoot through structural reforms and confidence boosting measures. To give just one example, Central bank cannot stop electricity load with interest rates. The South African Reserve Bank can be held accountable for achieving low and stable inflation. But economic growth requires collaborative effort. It is simply not within the power of one institution to deliver it. It is a team sport. It needs contributions from education, from the development finance institutions, from the private sector, and from many other players. Our emphasis on growth as a team sport, however, does not crowd our concern for the specific problem we can address, which is weak demand. Right now, demand has been badly damaged by the coronavirus lockdowns. In technical terms, we think the output gap is deeply negative. 
This feeds into the APC's policy stance. We have slashed interest rates to support ag aggregate demand and the spending power of South Africans. In doing this, we are supporting that part of growth in the near term, which can influence, which we can influence. We have become clear about this uh, in recent years, including, as part of this, adopting the quarterly projection model as a main forecasting tool for the Monetary Policy Committee back in 2017. The quarterly projection model sets up a proposed path for interest rates, which it gets from a so-called Taylor rule. That rule responds to the output gap as well as inflation. Indeed, because the output gap also affects the inflation rate, the rule responds to weak growth twice. The output gap gives us a measure of slack, and that gap in turn has an impact on inflation. Would it make sense to add growth or employment to the mandate of the SAP alongside the price stability mandate? I'm sure it is possible, but I doubt this uh, would change policy much. After all, we already include growth in our models and decision making. Through the output gap, a comprehensive map of economic slack. The problem is that formally adding an extra mandate in a context of our propensity to stagflation could encourage policy stakes and weaken credibility. South Africa's growth and employment problems are bigger than monetary policy. For instance, even when the economy was booming, unemployment stayed above 20%. As with growth, the bedrock of this problem is structural, not cyclical. In this is the legacy of Bantu stands, apartheid education, and the failure to fix those problems. Our labor markets have also historically raised the cost of hiring people even when the economy is weak and people are losing jobs. This cost inflation has further undermined job creation even when growth picks up. For these kinds of uh, structural reforms, an employment mandate is likely to be effective. More likely, we would find ourselves in other bands. We would not get unemployment permanently lower, but we would be stuck with higher inflation, making our, our growth and jobs challenges even worse. We want to be crystal clear that we won't make that mistake. With inflation well anchored, moves to lower interest rates should get us more real than inflation. And this is exactly where we are now. But doesn't everyone have low inflation right now? Isn't this due to coronavirus, not monetary policy? Well, this brings me to the second common argument we have, um, we have had, uh, which uh, is that lower inflation has been a common phenomenon, not an accomplishment of inflation targeting. There is no doubt that global factors affect inflation. Globalization? And low manufacturing, low cost manufacturing have made goods cheaper. The recent collapse in oil prices has been a big disinflationary shock. But we also have good evidence that countries with 
independent, inflation-targeting central banks have lower and less volatile inflation. And we can see that there are still countries with high inflation rates, despite low global inflation. The easy examples of this are the hyperinflation cases like Venezuela and Zimbabwe, but there are less extreme cases that show the value of sensible monetary policy. Consider Turkey, a middle-income country like South Africa. In June this year, Turkish inflation was 12.6%. In South Africa, it was 2.2%. Both these economies have low growth, had low growth of less than 1% before COVID-19 hit. Both countries experienced big currency depreciations this year. Both are major importers of oil and have benefited from its collapse. So why are their inflation rates so different? The point here is that the independence of the central bank matters with the experience of other emerging and developing economies bearing testimonies. Since 2015, Turkey's inflation rate has averaged 11.6% against a target of 5%. For the same period, South African inflation has been within our 3.6% target range, averaging 5%. Examples like this make it crystal clear that low inflation is not just a worldwide fact that countries can have for free. If individual countries don't make an effort, they can easily get stuck with high inflation. The next argument is that inflation targeting is a rich country policy. Inappropriate for in market targets like South Africa. In fact, inflation targeting has been adopted widely by emerging markets. This makes sense, as many of us have learned from bitter experience that tolerating inflation isn't developmental. It just creates instability. Tolerating inflation isn't developmental. It just creates instability. It is worth noting that there are more developing country inflation targeters, about 25, compared with 11 among the advanced economies. And while New Zealand gets the credit for being the first to implement inflation targeting, the second country was an emerging market, Chile. Differences between advanced and emerging economies tend to be reflected in target designs, designs that are not one size fits all. Most rich countries have found they like a 2% target, but emerging markets have used other sizes, often 3% or 4%. Most recently, critics of monetary policy here in South Africa have flipped by 180 degrees. The sub was originally accused of wrongly importing a first world policy to South Africa. But now we are told to follow major advanced economies and launch a big quantitative easing program. So far, for so much for the calm that rich country policies don't work in um, uh, developing countries. This brings me to the next part of my speech, which is really about new challenges to Asian targeting. In South Africa, there is a surprising amount of interest in QE. From being a cane jargon, many people have suddenly developed passionate views about it, and it gets lots of media interest. Given all this, let me summarize 
where we are in this conversation. As I explained in a recent speech at Vets University, quantitative easing will become appropriate when interest rates are at the zero lower bound and there is this inflation, deflation risk. While inflation has eased and created space for lower rates, I am not aware of any professional analyst who preps deflation in South Africa. Our own sub forecasts are in line with this concern. Nonetheless, should inflation, deflation take root, should deflation take root, we would be prepared to deploy the tools at our disposal as appropriate to achieve our mandate. Our inflation targeting framework would help us make that decision and would underpin the credibility of any step we might need to take. In the current circumstances, ever, we think that a quantitative easing program doesn't make much sense for South Africa. Some advocates of quantitative easing argue that it is a way of financing government deficits. Of course, this is not true. The funds created by to buy a bonds would flow into the interbank money market, lowering the cost of funding. This cost of funding is in fact the repurchase rate, which is our main monetary policy tool. To ensure that the rate stays where the NPC wants it, despite the extra funds in the system, we would have to borrow those funds back ourselves, which could be costly. To repeat, quantitative easing would not be free money. Nonetheless, there are still claims that quantitative easing could work because the sub would buy long-term bonds at a high interest rate in the region of 9%, and then pay sterilization costs equal to uh, the repo rate at 3.5% currently, and profit from the spread, borrow at 3%, lend at 9%. What a great business model it would be. But fortunately, the South African Reserve Bank is driven by public interest and not by profit. And clearly, there are some risks embedded in this pricing. Our or, or private buyers would simply take this profit. They would have had an opportunity to eat this free lunch already. In fact, we intervened to bring down a um, um, uh, long end bond yields. We would be transferring risk back to the public balance sheet, whilst also removing incentives for new lending to the public sector. One of South Africa's uh, fiscal advantages is that the average maturity of government debt is unusually long relative to that of our peers. At the start of this year, it was a bit over 12 years. The whole point of borrowing long term like this, even though it costs a bit more, is to share risk with investors. This means that when things like the coronavirus and credit ratings downgrades happen, bond prices fall, and borrowing costs go up. But this debt need not be rolled over at interest rates because government has already received the funds long term at the old interest rate. The risk is shared. But should the staff start doing QE, however, 
by buying um, bonds on the secondary market. Well, if that was to happen, then investors could shift risk back onto the public sector balance sheet at a higher price. In other words, it would be a private sector bailout arranged by the SAP. Worse, QE would reduce the incentives for new investors to come and buy long-term sovereign debt because there wouldn't be enough yield or compensation for longer-term risks now visible. What happens with QE instead is that public borrowing switches to the short end of the curve. As the central bank buys long-term bonds, it also sells uh, to the private sector short-term instruments in their place, with the net result that the only new debt the private sector ends up with is that short-term debt. Given that our short-term instruments like sub-debentures are like um, national treasury bills, it turns out that QE is much more exciting than it looks. Not only can National Treasury effectively make its own QE by funding itself through te Treasury bills, but it actually is doing so. Its pre-crisis borrowing strategy was astute. It left room in the end of the yield cap to borrow in an emergency. Lower inflation and a lower repo rate have made that borrowing cheaper than it otherwise would have been. In these circumstances, it's not at all clear what a sub-quantitative easing program would add. Rather than trying to supplant private investors or take away the risk of investing, we have focused on liquidity. Specifically, we have been buying bonds in the secondary at maturities in the context of a sudden stop in global capital flows. As the central bank, we have unique powers to provide liquidity, and we have used them to restore market functioning. These interventions have been helpful so far. Yields have fallen. We didn't set out to lower the yields specifically, but it turns out that this function was part of the reason why yields were so high. So putting all the pieces together, this monetary fiscal mix allows more spending in the context of a major emergency. We are happy by setting low interest rates and by ensuring that the government bond market remains liquid. National Treasury is able to sell its debt to investors. This approach is going to deliver a historically high of spending this year, even adjusting stimulation growth and inflation and excluding interest costs. National Treasury is not cutting spending in the middle of a crisis. They are raising it to the highest levels on record. However, we also need to think about the next few years. National Treasury is already claiming deficits of 14.6% of gross domestic product this year, 9.3% of GDP next year, and 7.7% of GDP the year after that. In this context, high long-term interest rates are a critically important signal about what savings are available. We should be listening to this message. Not try to temporarily suppress it through sub-interventions just switch long-term debt for short -term. We are in very difficult circumstances, but quantitative easing is not the answer. We need to focus on real solutions. Our discussion 
of QE takes to the final part of my talk to you this afternoon. It is about new challenges to the inflation targeting paradigm. Kevin King, uh, uh, the former governor of the Bank of England, has noted all previous monetary policy paradigms have fallen sooner or later. The cap will also be replaced eventually. One that's better for future circumstances. What, what might change? Many of the advanced economies, inflation targeting is in lunges. Inflation target inflation in below their inflation targets for many years now. Point stuck at zero. And instruments like quantitative easing and what guidance does not be powerful enough to solve problem. It is not to explain the Bank of Japan or the European Central Bank has been unable to push inflation to targets of around 2% despite these aggressive monetary policies. At this stage, there is little consensus on the answers. And Less on positions. And two basic set explanations for why inflation has stayed so low in advance. Why central banks are unable to lift it. One emphasizes beyond the control of centers, such as changes in labor markets or demographics. For instance, in an aging society, people want to save and they don't want to risk. So demand is limited and interest rates are low. This explanation works well for places like Japan. Another kind of explanation puts the emphasis on where borrowers had debt, even small interest rate increase like effects on demand while large rate cuts boost it further. As one in this literature put it, the black hole of debt is inescapable. Down inflation and the rate. An alternative version is that lower interest rates encourage financial risk taking which leads to crisis, depressing the economy, lowering inflation, and generating even lower interest rates. In these cases, to lose monetary policy eventually causes very high debt levels that smother economic growth, or it ends up causing financial crisis. I don't think South Africa has these problems yet. Right now, we don't have the high inflation and high interest rates of the past, but we also do not have zero rates and close to zero inflation of the rich countries. The inflation targeting paradigm is working pretty well. Given all the challenges facing South Africa, we recognize that monetary policy is the last place where we should consider risking changes. We have an established targeting framework, which is delivering low interest rates and inflation. This is the most functional part of macroeconomic framework. Unfortunately, getting monetary policy right isn't going to be enough. South Africa's debt situation is critical. Our rebound from long from lockdown is looking weak compared with other countries. As a country, we need to find a path back to fiscal sustainability and growth. We follow from new creditors. Shift our debt towards borrowing. 
we can move things around different sheets. This is not a strategy. It's just a way to buy time. If public sector borrowing were the way to achieve sustained growth, the last years of, of debt accumulation should have produced spectacular numbers. The, the real now is restoring our fiscal ability and implementing structural reform so the economy has a way to become more efficient and grow. In many, as a country, we seem to be depressed, unable to get out of bed. Yes, it's winter and it's cold. But we can't live like this. Spring is coming. Inflation and interest rates. No. What we need is to focus on the opportunities. We must get up and get to work. We can get South Africa working. Demonstrated as a country, ability to conquer. All right, apologies. We seem to be losing that uh, feed, uh, uh, the webinar by the University of Pretoria as well as the South African Reserve Bank. This is to mark uh, the 100 years of the Faculty of Economics and Management Sciences at the University of Pretoria. So we have the, the Reserve Bank Governor, Leseja Khanyaho, uh, talking, uh, touching on a number of things, talking about uh, monetary policy in the shadow of COVID-19 pandemic, uh, reflecting on the lessons from uh, the 20 years of inflation targeting here at home uh, touched a bit on uh, the concerns of the youth about today's monetary policy he's also touched a bit as well on the 20 years of inflation targeting as i said but also spoke out about uh, the lessons for future policy makers as well as academics saying that the south african reserve bank has achieved low as well as stable inflation but uh, spoke a bit about the importance of the independence of the central bank uh, how that contributes of course to uh, the less volatile inflation monetary policy uh, the governor says that uh, it's inevitable that's the change of course but right now he says there is nothing to fix so we having issues with that link unfortunately but for now let us uh, take